Hello, everyone. Once again, bringing you a getting real with uh, Carrie the Mortician questionnaire that was sent to me by a student who needed to interview somebody. And I always am saying yes, usually. Um, and so gets to a little chance for you to get to know me better in one quick video and maybe answers a new question for you that you haven't heard in one of my videos before. So let's get started. How did you get into the funeral industry and how long have you been in it? I started when I was 16 working at a funeral home and I turned 16, needed a job, needed to pay for that gas money for my new little ride. Um, and I couldn't even tell you, it was like a Ford Tempo Focus something, had a huge rust stain on the driver's side door, it was little and blue. Um, and my mom was an aftercare coordinator at a funeral home. Can you guys hear? There's a huge storm going on here, and I feel like the thunder is so loud. Maybe you guys can hear it. But um, so my mom was an aftercare coordinator. I needed a job. The funeral home had an evening office person and like visitation worker, and both days on the weekend had full days that they had somebody covering the building because that was before cell phones, and they used pagers, so they had people that would answer the phone on site. So there I was, that was my job. I worked visitations, I set up chairs, I broke down chairs, I typed paperwork on a typewriter, which are still used today at some funeral homes, and cleaned and just greeted people. And that was my job. And I did that all through high school. Uh, people obviously were, you had different responses to it. I think some people thought it was odd, but just, I just kind of blew it off. I didn't really think much of it. And then, then I went to college and wanted to be an epidemiologist and realized it wasn't as much kind of dealing with the epidemics as it was running numbers, doing the statistics of the epidemics. And I didn't really love that part of it as much. Um, and so I went into psychology, which was a huge love of mine. I love forensic psychology. I just love diving into minds and how they work. But I didn't really want to go for a doctor. I didn't want to go the long haul. And to do a lot of the things I wanted to do, you would have to do that. Um, so my mom said, why don't you try being a funeral You're so comfortable with it. You enjoy being at the funeral home. Why not? And there I landed. And I think along the way, I always got people who made silly jokes and when dating, you know, um, some men were totally turned off by a whole idea that I worked at a funeral home and it bothered them. You could tell some people were interested by it. Um, at the end of the day, I feel like it's not unlike a lot of other professions that you're going to get people that give mixed responses to them. So it wasn't as big of a deal as I think some would think. Does work ever go home with you? How do you leave the stresses and emotions at work when you get home? How do you handle negative criticism? I think the work always comes home with me. It's a 24 seven type business. Like, you know, people don't just die nine to five. So when you're on call in the evening or maybe a family emails now, we have the email and texting. And so families are a little more connected to funeral directors now than they were even 10 years ago where they may text you or they're going to email or connect with you in different ways than they would have before. So you're a lot more on call and open to families than previously. So Definitely it goes home with you. Definitely sometimes the emotions of it go home with you. I would say not often, it's often that it's the heavy, sad emotions. Sometimes it's just drama of dealing with people, that there's people who are demanding or people who, you know, get you agitated. So it's kind of like any workplace where your coworkers can upset you or people customers can upset you or things like that, that that comes home with me probably more than sadness and such that most people think, oh, I must go home sad and be so sad all the time because of my work. But I didn't lose the person. So that sadness level that you feel as somebody who's lost someone is not there um, like it would be. Definitely there's times that it does bother me, but not all the time. Um, how do you leave the stresses and emotion at work? It's like I said, it's, it's not the kind of emotions that go home with you like you would, but how often are you taking home your work day? Think about your work day and how often you come home and you're upset about this happened or upset that that happened or somebody's pissed you off or 
you know, the weight of having to get a deadline in or doing emails or, oh my gosh, I have to call this person back tomorrow at work and so, same thing, no different than my work. Um, so I just deal with death. Um, so that definitely has a small component that is different maybe than your workplace, but it's not as different as a lot of people think. Negative criticism. Um, I am at the point that I am knowing that I need to always be learning. When you first get into the business, I think like any maybe younger person, you think you know so much and you're ready to attack and you've gone through school and you can do it and it hurts your ego a little more if somebody tries to correct you or tell you some different way to do it. Now I step back and see that maybe I did something wrong or maybe I could do it better or maybe there is another way to build the wheel. Um, and so I think I'm at the point that I'm, I, my eyes are open more and I'm more humble in the work I do. And so I think, you know, with age, you, you get a better sense of being able to change your process if there's a better way and understanding that you can learn from other people. I can learn from someone who's just coming out of school just as much as I can someone who's been in the business 50 years. So you have to be open to learning at all places. What's my favorite part of being a mortician? Something I love and what's the easiest part of the job? My favorite part, I think, is getting to know people's stories. I love hearing stories about people, getting to know the full life behind who has died. I love talking to people, getting to know people, I connect with them and I just I get all wrapped up in the story pretty quickly. The easiest part of my job, I don't know what the, I guess the easiest part in, in what aspect? Um, the easiest part, let's see. Um, I don't know that um, connecting with people. I, I think it's easy for me to connect to people. And so maybe that's the easiest part. Sometimes that's the hardest part. Sometimes it's really hard to connect to people. People come in really defensive or standoffish and sometimes it's hard. So. It's one of those things can swing both ways, I think, when you're dealing with humans and dealing with stuff. So um, like that. So I would say easiest and hardest. The part I hate about my job or don't like about my job, um, the politics, the politics of business and dealing with maybe coworkers you don't see eye to eye to. And I get frustrated and then I just get all frazzled and I get wound up and that is my least favorite part by far. Um, and something I hate, oh, you know, dealing with any of the icky goo stuff in the prep room is obviously something I'm not going to love. Uh, but outside of that, it's just the politics of the job. What's a normal day? Yeah, there's no normal when it comes to this. Um, you know, some people, if they work in one role, one capacity every day, all day, they come in, they do the same thing. Maybe they get a care center. Like you come in, you look at, like the deceased tooth coming overnight, you find out who needs to be prepped, who needs to be dressed, who needs to be makeup, who needs to get put in their casket, where the caskets need to go. And then you just go through your day in order of what needs to be done first. And if you're going in, you might need to come in, catch up on a few things that have come in overnight in terms of like from families you worked with before. And then you may need to just check emails find out who's died the night before, make phone calls to set up arrangements, get paperwork ready for arrangements. But every day is so different. There's no way to even talk through a normal day because every day is so different. What are steps you go through every day? What are steps you take from the moment you get the phone call to pick up a deceased until burial or cremation? Oh, steps I go through every day, check an email looking at the past files and seeing if I can do something that hasn't been checked off on them. I'm going to do that every day I go into work. I check on each file just to see if something new is able to be done, if I can order death certificates or finalize death certificates, if I need to email in an obituary. I'm going to do that. There's no walking through a normal step because everyone is so different. Um, I mean, if you get the call for anything, then you either send a service to go bring the deceased in or you go out as a team to bring the deceased in. Um, you kind of log them in, maybe take a fingerprint, put them in the system. 
Um, then set up the arrangement time, you meet with the family, find out cremation or burial is the disposition, if there needs to be embalming, you get authorization, you collect all the death certificate information, you write the obituary, you may have to get the website up and running. If there's gonna be a service, you have to call the cemetery, the vault company, the casket company, the pastor, maybe an insurance company, maybe a singer, um, maybe a hearse company run a hearse, maybe a limo company, maybe a horse drawn carriage, who knows, um, you know, whatever you need to rent for the day, um, embalm, cosmetize, dress, casket, set up the room, bring in all the flowers, get the staff all lined up for our visitation services. If it's cremation, get the medical examiner permit signed, get the death certificate signed by the doctor, file the death certificate, get the copies, um, get the burial stop permit um, printed, or get the um, cremation authorization printed, talking to the family however many times along that that you need to, sending in the obituary. So there's a million steps that are happening, um, or ordering an urn, engraving an urn, getting the proof from the family, getting photos, making videos, making the printed material, um, million little steps. What's the difference between a mortician and a funeral director? Can you be one without the other? So nowadays they're just one term. So if you go to certain states like Ohio, you can be a funeral director without being a embalmer. However, mortician does not just mean embalmer. The funeral director doesn't just mean you make arrangements and run a funeral. They cross over. It's a huge gray area term now. So they don't mean one over the other anymore. Have you ever had a client that made you reconsider your career choice? No, there's some families or people that I've had to deal with that make me not want to work with families for a little while because they're such a struggle to work with. They're really difficult and abrasive. Maybe they lie to you. Maybe they give you the runaround and they make it really hard to do your job. And sometimes you just need like a break from interacting with families because of them. What is the process for a client? Do you do everything for a single person in one day? No. So you have a deceased gentleman. Do you do everything to care for him in the same day? No. Um, most likely not. Depends. There's, there's no one answer for any of this because every single call plays out differently. It depends on if the family's in town, if the family's out of town, if you're doing things by phone, by Zoom, by email, in person, if you have to order things, if you have them in stock, if there's embalming, cremation, burial, like every little thing that's picked along the pathway changes the trajectory of that path. So you could have two calls and just one little thing different about each changes that trajectory to get to the end. So there's no one path for any family. Everyone is different somehow. Even a husband and wife that die a week apart and they want the same thing, you're doing something different along that path because you were working with a spouse before and now you're working with kids. Something is going to be different. How do you feel with different religions and faiths that are not yours? Or how do you work with different religions? I know you have to be a professional, but do you go with what they are saying? For instance, say they're Christian. Do you comfort them by saying something about God, even if it's not what you believe? No, I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. I am going to, I respect people's choices and their beliefs and what they do, even if it's not my own. I have not encountered something that I have been completely against in belief, like a Satanist or something of that nature. Um, thankfully, I haven't encountered that. So that might be a little different for me if it's something that's like the polar opposite of my belief. But I love working with different faiths and learning about their faiths and learning what I can do to respect their time of loss and what they're going through in their faith to care for their loved one. I love watching that and learning. So if I go to a Catholic church, I will cross myself out of respect, um, but I'm not going to take communion when it's not allowed. I'm not, I don't genuflect. Um, I will bow though in the, in the Catholic church, 
every time I cross in front of the cross out of respect. And I will do things out of respect. If I know a church has their, their church women wear maybe skirts, if I have a skirt suit, I may wear it to the church. Just because I don't want to offend, it's not because, oh, I want to play along with their beliefs or anything. It's because I just don't want to offend. I want to blend. I don't want to be someone of resistance during that funeral. I want to be someone that's being helpful and doing things for. We had a um, Buddhist service once and we had to light three incense and bow three times and put incense in. And the family was going to stay at the funeral home for the whole day, every day, all day. And we said, listen, if you need to take a break, we are happy and honored to go in. If the incense gets low, light three more, bow three times and put them in. And they said, would you really do that? We said, of course. So we helped them keep their incense going for their loved one. Bowing three times meant nothing to me, but doing that action meant something to them. So how is it hurtful for me to do the action? I don't think it is, but that's my belief. Some people may not do that because they think it's against their religion, but I would believe that my God sees my kind action, hoping someone else, even though they may not have the same belief as me, so long, long answer, but that's, that's I think, how I, I see things. Um, what is the proper process for embalming? Um, I'll give the really abridged short version since I have too many videos about embalming. Um, but there's bathing, there's setting the features, which is closing the mouth and eyes. Then we will raise the vessels, which means making an incision and raising an artery and a vein. We mix a solution that's typically formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde based and inject that into the artery and get drainage out of the vein. Once we've put in a solution, two to four gallons, depending on weight and size of the individual, we suture up that hole. We will then aspirate using a trocar, which is a long, big needle. We insert that into the abdomen and with a suction uh, machine attached to that, we will puncture all the internal organs and kind of remove blood or liquid or things in the digestive tract and the lungs throughout the abdomen and cavity. And then we replace it with straight fluid, cavity fluid. We put in a choke button. We'll bathe the person again, wash their hair, shave them, clean under their nails. And then they are ready to be prepped with clothing and makeup and everything. Does restoration occur during the embalming process? What are steps for restoration? Well, restoration is a big, huge word. It could just be tissue filler. It could be reconstructing the whole head. So that's a huge broad term as well. During the embalming process, we are preserving. That is the main step in restoring anybody is preserving. We, if you don't have a good preserved body, there's no sense in doing restoration. Because that body will kind of go bad before anybody can even appreciate that restoration. So you preserve first and then restore second. So restoration is gonna look like a lot of things, but our goal is preserve and dry out tissue so that if we are gluing and closing incisions or you know um, abrasions, things like that, they need to be dry. Wax does not stick to wetness. Glue does not really stick to wetness. So we need everything to be dry, then we can go from there. Are there differences between taking care of men versus taking care of women? Are there other steps you must take for one gender that you don't for the other? Um, we have to handle the breasts on a woman by making sure they're not falled off to the side or fallen off to the side. So we will suture them up and together, suturing through the nipple area on both or using clamps or sometimes people use duct tape to hold the breasts up and in place and then hopefully be firm after the embalming to stay up and in place and then the bra put on. So that's one thing we do. Um, otherwise, you know, we shave both genders. We wash hair on both genders. We bathe both genders. So there's really not anything different that comes to the top of my mind that I would do differently between men and women, honestly. What are the jobs you do at a visitation and a funeral? Greet people, make sure there's 
Kleenex out. Sometimes I'll bring water to the family, immediate family during the visitation, make, checking the temperature in the room to make sure it's not warmed up too much and the air is flowing well. Um, you don't want it to be stuffy and hot, um, but you also don't want it to be too cold. So just checking levels of everything as you have influxes and defluxes of guests and visitors checking music, making sure it's playing, checking the video, make sure it's playing well. Sometimes I'll do a walk by of the deceased to make sure if they had a lot of makeup on them that hasn't all been rubbed off or that they're not leaking or things like that. Checking for flowers that need to be brought in that are brought late during the visitation or the service. Um, during the service itself, once it gets started, you may be running the video, you may be running the sound and the music but kind of just making sure things are in place for when that service gets done and what's going to happen. What does the funeral director say, have to say at the gravesite after everyone leaves? Oh, why does the funeral director have to stay at the gravesite after everyone leaves? Um, be, sometimes it's law that you have to stay with the deceased until they're enclosed in the vault or after, you know, you just stay for safety. I'm in charge of that deceased until they are officially buried. And that sometimes means when the vault lid is on and closed and nobody can get to that deceased again, essentially. So it just depends on the state and what the laws are. How do you comfort family and friends at a visitation or funeral? More so, how do you comfort the family person in, gen or person in general? Um, I don't really focus that my job is to comfort. My job is to make sure the process is going well. I need to make sure the deceased looks good and that their experience is what it needs to be. Um, I can't make them feel better. You've lost someone, you've lost someone close to you, and it sucks. So I can't really comfort them. You can't take away pain, you can't take away that loss. There's nothing you can say to really truly comfort in that moment. I can just make sure I am doing what I need to do to take care of every little detail that needs to be taken care of. I need to be one step ahead of the family so that they're never in want of much. If I know they took home four easel or four picture boards, I wanna have four easels out so when they walk in, they're there and ready to go and that we're not having to you know, mess around trying to get things out for them that weren't prepared. So I wanna make sure things are ready, things are good, things are in place, things are flowing. When they walk in, their jackets are taken, they're shown where they can put purses, they're shown where there's water, they know where the bathrooms are, the flowers are out, things are set up the way they want them. Do you need anything changed with how your loved one looks? Is the lip color okay? Is their hair okay? Blah, blah, blah. You know, just going over these things and making sure and kind of just being in tune with that family when they come in for a first viewing to make sure things are exactly how they need to be. You don't want them wondering where they need to be, what they need to be doing, how things are happening. You need to make sure they know those things and things are verbalized. You can't assume families know anything. They're not professionals that being grievers at funerals. They don't know that you have a car list that's given to everybody to know who's going to be lined up where. They need to know that information. They need to know when they arrive the next day, someone will be parking them in order. So it's verbalizing and communicating with that family. Is there anything you wish people understood about the funeral industry? Do you have any advice for someone interested in this career? Um, I wish people understood how much work there is that you don't see that we do. That's not playing with dead bodies. <laughs> um, I think that's something that I'm hoping to shed light on with doing videos and things is, is what we truly do as funeral professionals and as embalmers and as directors and to have more value in the work that we do. Um, that's one thing I wish people understood. Advice, do not go to school without having shadowed, having taken a funeral director lunch and talked to them, having done more than just attend a funeral and have that good Mormon fuzzy and want to be a funeral director. You need to see the other like 90% of what happens at a funeral besides a funeral or at a funeral home besides a funeral. Um, you need to know more before you jump in and go to school. 
So that is one thing anybody interested in the business needs to do is learn more about the backside of things, learn more about the day-to-day -day life of a funeral director. What has working in the funeral industry taught me? Oh, um, I think it's all the normal life lessons that maybe people would tell you um, without being too cliche. You know, anything can happen at any time. Cherish the people around you. Always be learning. Um, things change in the world and in our society, but at the end, we're all still the same. We all still die. We all still are on the same table. and <laughs> We're all still cared for by the same people. Um, it's the same end for everybody, no matter your race, religion, economic status. It doesn't matter if you are evil or good. You kind of have that same end process um, when it comes to your, your body being cared for. And it's an equalizer, death is. And we all are told that, but I get to see that all the time. Um, it doesn't mean go out and be really bad because we're all going to still die. It just means that don't see yourself as better than somebody else because at the end of the day, that somebody else is, could be laying next to you on the same, you know, in the same room on a table next to you and you're supposed to still just going to be dead. Um, beyond that though, you know, somebody else will judge us. It's my belief, but don't assume you're better than somebody else or that somebody else is um, not not as valued as you because of any one reason or another. So, um, you know, we're all the same in the end, I guess, essentially in some ways. So thank you for your questions. I know I rambled through those. Some of those were a little more all the um, sub questions within the questions, but thanks guys. That's a little more about me um, for you. And hopefully you learned one new thing new about me. If you've watched a lot of my videos, uh, I like you to learn maybe one more, one more new thing each time you watch a video. Thanks so much, and email me with questions if you have them, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.